Among the Hidden, Chapter 8. At the end of this chapter, I am going to have you write in your reading notebook what you think the most important event from Chapter 8 is. Hint, it's toward the end. One cool rainy morning, a few weeks later, Luke's family left in such a rush they barely had time to say goodbye. They dashed out the door after breakfast, Matthew and Mark complaining about their packed lunches, Dad calling back, I'm going up to that auction in Chesterville, won't be home till supper. Mother hurried back and handed Luke a bag of cracklings and three pears and some biscuits from the night before. She muttered, so you won't get hungry, and gave him a quick kiss on the head, and then she was gone too. Luke peeked around the stairway door, surveying the chaos of dirty pans and crumb-covered plates left in the kitchen. He knew not to look out as far as the window, but he did anyway. His heart gave a strange jump when he saw the window was covered. Someone must have pulled the shade the night before to try to keep the kitchen warm and then forgotten to race it in the morning. Luke dared to lean out a little further. Yes, the shade was down on the other window, too. For the first time in almost six months, he could step into the kitchen and not worry about being seen. He could run, skip, jump, dance even on the vast linoleum without fear. He could clean up the kitchen and surprise mother. He could do anything. He put his right foot out tentatively, not quite daring to put his full weight on it. The floor squeaked. He froze. I really feel like this sentence kind of gives us a hint into Luke's personality, how he's a little bit, has the feeling of being a little bit scared, and his reaction to that is it makes him kind of timid, or, you know, his nervousness makes him timid. Um, he's not a very daring person. He's also very cautious. Like, he takes his time with things, making sure the shades are drawn, that he's not too heavy on the floor, even though he knows no one is around. He went back, nothing happened, but he retreated anyway. He went back up the stairs, crawled along the second floor hallway to avoid the windows, and then climbed the stairs to the attic. He was so disgusted with himself, he could taste it. I'm a coward. I'm a chicken. I deserve to be locked away, and the attic ran through his head. No, 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 he countered to himself. I'm cautious. I'm making a plan. I love the thoughts and feelings here that the author uses so we really know how Luke feels about the situation or how to react as a reader, and we're going to be working with those in writing today. He climbed up onto the stool on top of the trunk that served as his perch for watching out the back fence. The neighborhood behind himself was fully occupied now. He knew all the families and had come up with names for most of them. The big car family had four expensive cars sitting in their driveway. The Gold family all had their hair the color of sunshine. The Bird Brain family had set a row of about 30 birdhouses along their backyard fence, even though Luke could have told them it was pointless to do that until spring. The house he could see best, right behind the Garner's backyard, was occupied by the Sports family. Two teenage boys lived there, and their deck overflowed with soccer balls, baseball bats, tennis rackets, basketballs, hockey sticks, an apparatus from games Luke could only guess at. Today, he wasn't interested in games. He was interested in seeing the families leave. He had noticed before that all the houses were empty by nine in the morning, with kids off to school and grown-ups off to work. Three or four of the women didn't seem to have jobs, but they left too, returning late in the afternoon with shopping bags. Today, he just had to make sure no one was staying home sick. The Gold family left first, two blonde heads in one car, two blonde heads in another. The sports family was next, the boys carrying football pads and helmets, their mother teetering on high heels. Then there was a flurry of cars streaming from every driveway onto the still sparkling new streets. Luke counted each person, keeping track so carefully that he made scratches on the wall and counted the scratches twice again at the end. Yes, 28. 28 people gone. He was safe. Again, I feel like this is another example or piece of evidence backing up his cautious nature. Luke scrambled down from his chair, his head spinning with plans. First, he'd clean up the kitchen, and then he'd start some bread for supper. 
He'd never made bread before, but he'd watched Mother a million times. Then maybe he could pull the shades in the rest of the house and clean it thoroughly. He couldn't vacuum, that'd be too loud, but he could dust and scrub and polish. Mother would be so pleased. Then in the afternoon, before Matthew or Mark or the kids in the neighborhood got back, he could put something on for supper. Maybe potato soup. Why, he could do this every day. He'd never considered housework or cooking particularly thrilling before. Matthew and Mark always scoffed at it as women's work. But it was better than nothing. And maybe, just maybe, if this worked, he could convince Dad to let him sneak out to the barn and help there, too. Pook was so excited, he stepped into the kitchen without a second thought this time. Who cared if the floor creaked? No one was there to hear it. He gathered up dishes from the table and piled them into the sink, scrubbing everything with extraordinary zeal. He measured out flour and lard and milk and yeast and was putting it all in a bowl, when it occurred to him it might be okay to turn on the radio very softly. Nobody'd hear, and if they did, they'd just figure the family had forgotten to turn it off, just as they had forgotten to raise the shades. The bread wasn't in the oven, and Luke was picking up lint by hand from the living room rug when he heard tires on the gravel driveway. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, too early for the school bus or mother or dad. Luke sprinted for the stairs, hoping whoever it was would just go away. No luck. He heard the side door creaking open and then Dad exclaiming, What the? He was back early. That shouldn't matter, but hiding on the staircase, Luke suddenly felt like the radio was as loud as an entire orchestra, like the smell of baking bread could fill three counties. I love the simile there when Luke says he feels like the radio was as loud as an entire orchestra. It clearly wasn't, but again, that's kind of relating to a thought and feeling there, too. Luke! Dad yelled. Luke heard his father's hand on the doorknob, and he opened the door. I was just trying to help, Luke blubbered. I was safe. You left the shades down, so I thought it was okay. And I made sure everyone was gone from the neighborhood, and... Dad glared. You can't be sure, he snapped. People like that, they get deliveries all the time. They get sick and come home from work. They have maids that come during the day. Luke could have protested, no, the maids never come before the kids get home from school. But he didn't want to give himself away any more than he already had. The shades were down, he said. I didn't even turn on a single light. Even if there were a thousand people back there, nobody would know I was here. Please, I've got to just do something. Look, I made bread and cleaned up and... What if a government inspector or someone had stopped by here? I would have hidden, like always. Dad was shaking his head. And leave them smelling bread baking in an empty house? You don't seem to understand, he said. You can't take any chances. You can't because... At that precise moment, the buzzer went off, sounding as loud as a siren. Dad gave Luke a dirty look and stalked over to the oven. He pulled out the two bread pans and tossed them on the stovetop. He flipped off the radio. I don't want you in the kitchen again, he said. You stay hidden. That's an order. He went out the door without looking back. Luke fled up the stairs. He wanted to stomp angrily, but he couldn't. No noise allowed. In his room, he hesitated, too upset to read, too restless to do anything else. He kept hearing, you stay hidden, that's an order, echoing in his ears. But he'd been hidden, he'd been careful. To prove his point to himself, at least, he climbed back on the perch by the back vents and looked out on the quiet neighborhood. All the driveways were empty. Nothing moved, not even the flag on the Gold family's flagpole or the spokes on the bird brain family's fake windmill. And then, out of the corner of his eye... Luke caught a glimpse of something behind one of the windows at the sports family's house. A face. A child's face. In a house where two boys already lived. Please remember in your reading journal to write down what you thought the most important event of chapter 8 was. There were a lot, there was a lot of action, but one of the events toward the end was definitely the most significant.